Hello, and, and welcome to Big Data in Sports Ticketing, presented by Live Analytics, a Ticketmaster company. We're proud to have Ticketmaster as a sponsor again this year, and they've prepared a great presentation for us today that I think you'll find very interesting. John Faris, General Manager and Senior Vice President of Live Analytics, will be talking about how his team has used the world's largest database of live events to help uh, improve the uh, understanding of fan behavior and ticket pricing. John Fries. All right. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Uh, so, yeah, it's great to be here. My name is John Fries. Uh, I was uh, lucky enough to be here last year as well, and it's. Um, it's just exciting to be at this conference and also to see that this conference is picking up more on the ticketing and business side of things. I, I think its roots were in figuring out how much you should pay Carmelo Anthony and, and whether you should make him go left or right or drive to the hoop. And now all those analytic techniques, uh, we're, we're picking up momentum around applying those to do the same thing, figure out what, what's the value of a fan, what's the value of a ticket. So uh, what I'm gonna talk about is Big data, uh, it's sort of a hot topic, hot term right now. And there's really uh, two questions that I think it can be pointed at that are very valuable to the teams. And so uh, I touched on these. One is, let me really understand what my fan looks like and what he's really worth. Wouldn't it be great if you could have a value, a lifetime value that you could apply to each and every fan and, and understand them? And then secondly, what, what's my seat worth? What are the tickets worth? We have all this data that we should be able to use to help figure that out. So those are the two broad themes here. I started at Ticketmaster about a year and a half ago, and one of the things that was so exciting when I came on was just how much data we actually have. I, I don't think we viewed ourselves as a data company a couple years ago, and now we see that as sort of a, a critical part of our value proposition. So uh, in any average month, we've got about 26 million unique visitors that are coming through, hitting the website, searching for events, transacting. The global database is about 211 million records, so that's how many people we have fan data on. About 100,000 events we ticketed just in the last year, 150 million sports tickets that we were touching in some way, shape, or form. So this is a lot of data. Now the challenge is uh, how do you make sense of it? What do you do with it all? And why does it matter? Well, why we think the data is important is really this slide here. The, the core of the issue is that there's a lot of seats that are still empty. So our estimates, and this is on the Ticketmaster footprint last year, 26% of the seats didn't, didn't have someone sitting in them. That's, that's just money left on the table. That equates to 50 million sports tickets across all of these segments and $900 million in uncaptured revenue. Now clearly, you're not gonna get all $900 million. It's the reason why those tickets didn't sell. It may have been awareness, it may have been that they were incorrectly priced, but even if you could get 10, 20% of that, that's hundreds of millions of dollars that are up for grabs here. So for us, it all starts with profiling, understanding what does that sports fan look like? And there's some interesting numbers that we always talk about that, that we like to start with. One is that top left number. So the uh, entertainment share of wallet for the average consumer in the United States, so this is what they spend their money on for entertainment. Movies, going out to dinner, uh, cable television. They're spending 6% on live events. There's a huge opportunity to increase the share of wallet, to, to have live events take more of that discretionary spend and make that um, make that number 10%. It just that alone would be a great increase. 55% of the population attended a live event in the last year, so you have 45% that are not attending. And then, uh, and this is where uh, there's some cool stuff we can do with our data. We find these interesting crossovers. So we ticket across sports, but we also do concerts, we do arts and theater, we do family events. When someone goes to a concert, that fan is twice as likely to also go to a sports event and vice versa. So you have this category crossover that gives you some good affinities and propensities that you can look at to help target and find these fans. And uh, so this is a busy chart, but um, this spider chart looked at uh, a bunch of different sports fans and then crossed it with their concert attendees. So we took the 100 top artists and the further you are out from the middle of this circle is the more that you cross over with that artist. So it's an affinity chart that, that can help you see what, uh, what the likes and dislikes are. A couple things jump out of this. The, the red line that's sort of the furthest out from everything, those are tennis fans. Um, this is not something I would have guessed going into this, but tennis fans um, are great 
of people to target for concerts and vice versa. And, and we'll talk a little bit about why that is in a slide or two, but they just happen to over-index on everything. If you can find a tennis fan, it's very good if you're in the live event business. Soccer fans, and now you get to some stuff that's a lot more intuitive. The soccer fans is the black line, and where do they over-index? Well, it's Latin artists, sort of makes sense. It's, it's what you would see. There's, a, there's um, uh, another one here that we like to call out, which is um, the basketball fans. So they go with uh, hip hop, and they also go with R&B and soul. Probably another one that's more intuitive, uh, not so much on the tennis fans, but it's just a very uh, simple way to look across and see these affinities. We pulled out the top artist across these four uh, sets of four sports fans, just so we could see it. So Jay-Z fans, if someone went to a Jay-Z concert, they're 3.6 times more likely to have gone to a basketball game over the course of a year. With football, the number one artist is Buffett. Uh, not as high of an over-index, but it's 2.8 times. Shakira goes with soccer. Hockey, the artist that seems to resonate the most is Van Halen, um, though I would say with hockey, Springsteen always shows up very high on those results. He, he got just edged out this year. So that was just looking at artists and, and some cross affinities where if you like one event, what other events are you gonna like? There's some even more basic stuff. Just look at the, the profile of these consumers, look at their demographics, look at their income levels. This is across those same sports fans. In this case, we look at male, female, and I would note, this is the ticket purchaser. So this is not all the people that are at the event. This is the person that actually transacted and bought the ticket. You see it's generally a male ticket purchaser. All these numbers for male, female are below 50% on the, on the female percentage. But you see motorsports, which I would have, have never guessed, and tennis skew a little bit more female. You then work your way down, household income. Now you start to see what's going on, maybe why these tennis fans go to so many events. They've got the money to do it, especially, uh, which will be on the next slide probably, but. Um, so they're, they're over on household income, motorsports a little bit lower. You can then start applying some other attributes and you can start seeing things like credit card ownership, luxury car ownership. And so here's a case where those tennis fans skew very high on luxury cars, as do the basketball fans. Two other proxy variables. So we talk with clients where, I mean, you can throw a lot of variables at understanding your fan base. If you want to simplify it down to just a couple that are very good simple scoring mechanisms, Discretionary income index is a very good one. So this takes not your income, but actually the income that's left over after uh, estimates of all the things you may have to pay money on. And it's what you can spend on discretionary things like live events. Now you see the tennis guys jump off the charts on this one. Um, and then the bottom one is something that is a proxy variable around your transaction activity. So this is a standard score that's used a lot in retail and merchandising and catalog sales where um, R is recency, F is frequency, M is monetary value. You score higher if you've had more frequent purchases. We've seen you more recently. The monetary size of the purchases are larger. We then score people from zero to 1,000. And what you see here is this gives you a very simple view of the total amount of past purchase activity. And generally, past purchase activity is one of the best proxies or best predictors of future purchase activity. So you do this across your fan base, and you can get a nice, simple score for them. And we found, and this is actually on the concert side, that you can sometimes get a little misled if you just look at some of the other variables. If you just went off of household income or you just went off of discretionary income, this was a case where it was a concert in Chicago and it turned out the best fans uh, had low discretionary income but had very high RFM scores. And that translated to them spending a lot per event. All, all that's kind of looking single variable, one or two variables at a time. One of the things that the teams are now uh, doing uh, much more is trying to actually model across all these variables. So get all the data in one place, get a foundation, and then set up a prospect model with the goal being that you want to take these people who might have gone to the venue once or twice, they're single game purchasers. Ultimately, the way uh, teams want it, they want to move the people, those people through a funnel where they become mini plan holders and ultimately they're season ticket holders. And, and who you want to move through the funnel, who are the best prospects is the name of the game. In this case, we set up some custom models that we do with the teams. There's sets of algorithms, regressions, and, and lookalike models, and we take people through and we score them from one to a thousand on um, how good a prospect they are. We also can, can simplify it and just give them a letter grade. So these D prospects are probably not people you should go after. They're gonna buy a game occasionally. You work your way through, you get through some funnels. The B list is actually your best prospects to go after mini plans, and your A list are your best prospects to go after season ticket holders. And it's just by looking across all these variables and seeing which ones pop 
and which ones are good predictors of someone upgrading their spend. Uh, this is an example of something we did with a hockey team recently. I'll, I'll focus on the stuff on the right. We uh, scored, uh, we set up the model, scored the database, and then we pulled a list out for them and said, all right, we think these are the best prospects. They'd opened up a new section of the arena and wanted to sell season tickets into that. And we decided it would be a good, good chance to just do a simple test, take the old method of which that they would prioritize and grab their lists and compare it to this modeled and scored method. The old method focused on uh, net income, household wealth. The new method was based on all the variables in the scoring. We suggested and recommended a much smaller list to go target. So the list was about a third the size of the way they would have pulled things in the past. The conversion rate was more than 3x, which was great, and it actually generated about 20% more revenue just doing the side-by-side -side testing. So, I mean, it, it works. It should work if you think about it. You're being able to see who, are, who within the database are your most likely folks by looking at past behavior, future predictions, and you get better conversion rates. It keeps you from burning through your prospect list, hitting people who are not the right uh, not the right prospects with the wrong offer, and you can be a lot more efficient. So that's getting season ticket holders. Uh, the other thing that's obviously very important to these guys is keeping the season ticket holders they have. We do quite a lot of primary research where we just talk to fans, ask them questions. Here's a case where we talked to uh, a number of season ticket holders. We did this last year about the same time as well, and we just said, hey, how likely are you to renew? Get a very simple aggregate number. The good news is, that the number is up a little bit. Uh, and so you see, I think it's washed out on there, but it's, it's uh, uh, 82% uh, in 2012 are planning to renew, a very healthy number. I know there's been a lot of talk on other panels about 15 years from now, what does a season ticket holder look like? But at least right now, it's, it's a pretty healthy number. Uh, but what you can also do is you can slice the people who said, I'm not planning to renew or I'm on the fence versus the ones that are planning to renew and see what they value in terms of the different benefits. And in this case, there's three areas where that gray bar, those are the ones that are undecided, actually are higher than the red bar. And so these are things that those people on the fence care more about uh, relative to the, to, the, uh, to the fans that are definitely gonna renew. And in this case, this can help you potentially with messaging or with programs where you're gonna go talk to them and try and save them and, and keep them uh, in the fold. One is savings on additional single game tickets, so messaging about, hey, here's the benefit you get if you want to buy more tickets. The other two at the bottom are just around discounts on parking and, and merchandise. So just like the prospect model, which is all about finding, uh, finding those prospects in your database, we do retention models. So now you're dealing with a smaller data set. These are the plan holders. And this is about figuring out two things. First, uh, how at risk are they to not renew? So score them so that I can get a bucket of people that I probably want to spend uh, some extra care and attention on because they're on the fence or they're at risk. And then secondly, for the ones that aren't at risk, help me think about who I might want to go after to upgrade, get them to buy more tickets, get them to move down in the arena or the stadium and, and spend more money. And this is an example of something we did with a baseball team uh, for last season. Uh, and that dotted line shows the uh, average renewal rate across the entire plan holder base. And the things that are in red are factors where they make you more likely to renew, and then the things that are in gray are factors that make you less likely to renew. So no surprise, if you look, that top one, we talked about this discretionary income index. If you have a high score there, that's a good sign you're likely to renew. You see some other things about age, ticket pricing. If you look at the dark ones, uh, you see a, a couple that, um, that are interesting. So this is a custom model. You can't generalize these to all teams, but there are some factors that we see almost every time we do these models. The attendance rate below 60%, you see that's about halfway through in that gray area. If the, if the fan is not showing up and we can collect that data and see whether they actually went through the gate, that's a big red flag. And so you gotta do something about that. Those are some of your most at-risk people. The other one is that first year, the first time plan buyer, so someone who's been a season ticket holder for one year, those generally have the lowest renewal rates. And so figuring out a way to move that number up, but also tailoring programs to those first year buyers to really make them feel special, feel like they're getting inside access can go a long way on the retention rate. All right, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and talk uh, social. And I, I alluded to this before, but um, the teams in Ticketmaster, we're in an interesting position where when someone buys a ticket, they generally are buying two, four, six tickets. We know a lot about the person who bought the ticket. We know nothing about the other three, four, six people that are showing up uh, at the game. And it's a, it's a big hole in understanding your fan base and understanding the, the, uh, 
the purchasers. So that's where we feel like, I mean, social's got a lot of buzz. People talk about it and are trying to figure out what to do with it. Um, that's where we really think social is gonna help here. So the average transaction size is 2.7 tickets. Social for us is all about helping us identify who are the other 1.7 people that are going into the game, you know, how can we ultimately communicate target to them uh, and, and have them be part of the family. Ticketmaster's invested a lot uh, on this side, uh, working very closely with Facebook. It started with us putting RSVPs where after you buy your ticket, you can immediately click and you've RSVP'd, it gets posted to Facebook, all your friends know that you're going to an event. The other thing that we did about six months after that was you can actually show on the interactive seat map you can tag it and say, and here's where I'm sitting. And now all your friends not only know that you're going, but they know what section you're in. And if they want to go, they can try and sit nearby. It's been very good. We've seen good adoption of those. So we looked at all the people over the last year that have bought through a social media link. So they clicked on that RSVP in some form. They clicked on a, on a, uh, on a, on a like or an interest. And then we compare those to the ticket purchasers in general, so the overall population. And so the stuff on the left, you see some interesting things around that. So you see a male skew on these people that are purchasing through social links. You see much higher discretionary income, and you see that they're buying higher price tickets. And, and as you'd expect, it's a younger phenomenon. So 18 to 24 is 26% of the folks versus just 9% for the general ticket buying population. 37%, 25 to 34. So Higher income levels, higher ticket spend, these are good customers to be attracting and getting a hold of. What we found is when, when a person uh, posts an RSVP on Facebook, we track back an incremental $5.30 in sales. So across all the posts, each and every individual post has a value back to us of $5. It's very powerful stuff when you can get someone to share that they're going to a live event. And the other thing on here, which uh, we were, we weren't sure what this was gonna show. We thought, all right, maybe these social folks are uh, sort of dead to email. The only way you can communicate with them will be by a social means, and so we'll have to think about, or we won't be able to use email. Turns out when we look at the responsiveness of this group, they're three times more likely to respond to an email or transact through an email than the general population in our database. So not only are they very active on social, but they still use things like email which is a good sign because it's still not that easy to go reach out and hit them with social channels. Just some baseline stuff on this. Now these are sports fans. 74% um, of the fans this year said that they're using Facebook. Twitter is a decent amount smaller, though it is growing, so Twitter's only at 35%. Um, these folks that are using it are using it heavily, though, for sports-oriented things. So you can see a lot of these activities 75% on Facebook, 72% on Twitter are either saying they like a team, liking a fan, following the fans, so they're very engaged. So the fans that are using this, this is a perfect use of your social media about sports, about live events, and all these numbers are very healthy and we're, and we're seeing them grow. The one that really matters though is this one, which is how is social influencing attendance? The whole reason why these social programs are in place is to drive uh, ticket sales and drive people into the venue. And so you see a couple things here. One is you see Facebook's a little stronger than, than Twitter. That matches some of the previous slides just about the usage levels. But you see this same age youth skew. This is the future of how people are gonna think about buying tickets. 24% of the 18 to 24 year olds have said, so a quarter of them have said, a social link influenced my attendance of an event in the last year. It's very powerful for the teams. And then the other thing we asked is, um, we sort of joke, if you ever look at, at uh, the crowd, about half of them have their heads down because they're, they're doing something on their mobile phone while the, while the game is going on or while the action's happening. So we just wanted to figure out, what are these guys doing with their phone while the game is going on? And so the stuff on the left, you see very high rates of texting, uh, checking scores, checking news about the team. Gray bars last year, red bars this year, they're all up a little bit. The only thing that's down is this uh, strange thing called actually calling someone on your phone. Um, and so, but still 45%. The ones on the right, I think are very powerful. So this is, the, this is using social media while you're at the game. And some of these have doubled, some of these have quadrupled. You see really uh, increased rates of this. So 42% now of the fans are sharing while they're at that game uh, what's happening. 25% are checking in. That number is, uh, is, is, uh, is a really interesting number. They're just going in, they're using Foursquare, one of those check-in methods, 
and then uh, tweeting is, is growing quite a bit. It's up 7x, so it's the lowest one on these three. So we talk about big data. Uh, one of the biggest sources of data is all of that social chatter and trying to make sense of it. There are a lot of companies now that are coming up with harnessing, harvesting techniques where you take all the chatter and try and make sense of it. We are partnering with a couple different companies. This is an example of something we did with a company called Mashworks. And we had them just look at all the chatter over the course of the NBA strike. And what you have here are, you can see when the real spikes happen in activity and communications. And you know some of these are not surprising. You'd expect when there's a big news event that you'll get a spike on this. One of the ones that is interesting is, you had a lot of activity when the players started going overseas or threatening to go overseas. A lot more activity than you would have expected on that. Obviously, when the actual leaks got canceled, that number five, you're going to see a big spike in activity through that. So you can get an idea of kind of what's the buzz, how is the buzz trending up or down, what's the general sentiment of that. And then we took it down another level and said, all right, now let's take anyone that's talking about the strike as it relates to ticketing and what are they saying. We sort of did it across this. And obviously, people weren't happy about it. It's not like you had a bunch of people saying, this is great. I'm so glad there's a strike. Uh, so a large percentage are angry. But these ones on the right were interesting to us. You had quite, quite a few people who said, I'm confused. And uh, the confusion was around the fact that there were some teams that were still making tickets available to be sold. And they were saying, well, why am I supposed to buy tickets now? Is the season happening? Is it not happening? And it was a good opportunity to, to think about how to tune the messaging and say, all right, well, maybe we should make it clear why the tickets are for sale, or is there a benefit of locking it in case the strike ends around that. But it's just, um, I mean, it's early days on this. There's so much data to be had uh, around social, and to use it to understand brand messaging and the impact of that messaging, how much stuff is being echoed in that echo chamber. All right, I'm going to shift gears one more time and uh, talk about pricing. So I mentioned all this data should be used to figure out how to price your tickets. Um, it's an interesting industry, and I think this has come up on some previous panels. But our estimates are that uh, in the US last year, online secondary sales were probably 3 to $4 billion in, in transaction value. It's a huge number. Um, now, that number should not be zero, but it probably should not be 3 to $4 billion. And this really is just a sign that the pricing is not optimal or efficient at this point. 70% of that, roughly, is for sports. So sports is a big part of this. This is not just the hot concert where all the top tickets got taken in the first hour. This is prevalent across uh, lots of events and, and really prevalent in the sports category. The other thing we see when we do this is that it's um, you know, it skews towards the fan having to pay more. There are certainly cases where the fan gets a deal because they can go to the secondary market and, and there's some tickets below face value. This is just laying out the, um, uh, the price a fan paid versus what the list or the face value was on it. So all the way on the left are cases where it was a huge discount. All the way on the right are cases where you might be paying five times face value on that. And we've seen this with a bunch of teams where we've pooled data with them. They've got access to some secondary data as well. And we just look, and you see that it starts where, yeah, there's some savings, but the, the incremental value or the incremental premiums that you pay generally outweigh the savings by about 4x. So this ends up being um, the fans paying more or the teams not getting revenue that theoretically should be going into their pockets. This came up a little bit yesterday. One of the uh, or two of the most important tools that the teams are now using, and I think have reached a tipping point on this, is both uh, variable pricing and dynamic pricing. So we did a quick census where we just checked what all the teams were doing. The NFL doesn't allow this at this point, so that's why there's, there's a zero on that. It's just a league policy. But for the other three leagues, um, you see variable pricing is up around 90%. So 90% of the teams are using some form of variable pricing. If you rewound five years and you were a baseball team, Every game was priced for a seat the exact, say it was $50. Every single game was $50. If it was the, the Yankees coming to town, it was $50, even if that was a Friday night and it was a division rivalry. Um, and if it was whoever was a seller dweller, it was still $50. The teams and the leagues have done a really good job with variable pricing by saying, you know what, there's some premium tier one games. Those are going to get priced higher. There's some games that might be against second tier opponents, third tier opponents. They might be a weekday we're going to discount those games. And they've been able to make the pricing more efficient and, and generate incremental revenue and improve attendance, because 
they're getting more, more money on the popular games, they're getting more people in the stadium on the less popular games. The other one though, and this one gets a lot more attention and a lot more buzz, is dynamic pricing. And I was surprised the numbers were actually this high. It's about you know, 40 to 60 percent uh, across those three leagues are using some form of dynamic pricing. And this is a this simple concept. Post the on sale, I change the price of the ticket. And uh, if it's a hot game and it's selling well, I'm going to uh, creep that ticket price up. And if it's soft, I, I'm potentially going to bring it down or come up with other discounting approaches. It, 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 the adoption is, it's growing. I mean, I think you go out five, ten years and you're going to see these numbers even higher. Um, and, and it will be interesting to see what the NFL ultimately does on this. So we asked fans what they thought of dynamic pricing. It's a tricky question uh, to ask, and um, it's hard to really know if the fans can, can, um, can understand the question. But what we, what we did last year was we said, OK, um, you know, give me on a scale of very fair, fair, neutral, all the way down to very unfair. How do you view if teams started changing pricing? And we asked it across the different levels. Uh, on the left side there is this idea, I'm going to change it constantly. This is like the airline model, where you know, you come back 10 minutes later, it could be a different price. Or maybe I'll just change it once during the whole on sale. You know, just you know, maybe two weeks beforehand based on how things are going. Fans are more accepting. You know, first of all, they sort of don't like it. So the, the overall number was, was lower than I would have thought. But they're more accepting if the changes are less frequent. The good news in all of this, because I think the dynamic pricing is inevitable, it's, 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 it's happening, it's going to happen, is that the numbers are flat. As more and more teams have adopted it, you haven't actually seen these numbers go down. And people say, oh, now that this is happening, this seems totally unfair. Part of it is the secondary market has been doing this. I mean, this is exactly what happens when you go try to buy on the secondary market. You don't expect that if you come back the next day and try and buy on that market, that same price that might have been available the previous day is still there. So that red line is higher than the black line for people who generally buy on secondary versus people who generally buy on primary. The other uh, dynamic going on here is that fan acceptance actually varies if you're a single ticket buyer and you just buy individual games versus you're a season ticket buyer. You would think if you said to a fan, hey, how would, you know, what do you think if we're going to lower prices of tickets for, for softer games that everyone would say, I love that. What's better than lower ticket prices? The season ticket holders don't like it that much. They like it less than the individual game purchaser. And it makes sense. Part of their whole value proposition was, I bought the whole season, and part of that was locking in these savings. And now you're giving a discount to these individual guys who don't have the same relationship. So the teams, there's a reason why this hasn't been going on. Uh, it's only started in the last few years. You've got to walk a tightrope here where you keep your fan base happy on this and, and you introduce it. So just a couple examples of things we've done with clients. This was with a baseball team where we ran through about five years of data and predicted the attendance for the 2012 season. We looked at the way they were variable pricing. We bucketed things by whether it was a popular opponent, whether it was weekend or weekday. There was a lot of other variables going into this. But what we found were there were a couple games, those two red squares, where we were predicting uh, very good attendance that would bump that up into a tier one game and sort of help the team think about either adding those, it wasn't a popular opponent, but based on uh, history and, and when the game was happening during the season, it was on a weekend, it was likely to sell very well. Um, and then um, it wouldn't be the analytics conference without some Jeremy Lin reference. So uh, this, is the, this is the token reference on this. This really is the, the case for dynamic pricing. So even if you set perfect pricing, perfect scaling, um, things change over the course of a season. And all you have to have is, is one team have something change. And so this is from the perspective of a third NBA team. That team has the Knicks and the Clippers coming to town a couple days apart in a couple weeks. And it's looking at uh, some different metrics and what's happened with the Lynn effect. And so all that stuff before the gray bars is what traffic levels were across a, a few different variables. You start in the top left. Those are people coming to the team or the Ticketmaster site to find out about the specific event. Uh, that's up 9x for the Knicks game for this team versus what it was at before that period. And just to get a baseline, you can sort of see the, the Clippers one's up a little bit. Generally, you are going to see interest in all these things grow um, as you get closer to the game. Google query volume, how many people are searching on the Knicks versus how many pe people are searching on the Clippers? Up 7x. Primary ticket sales up 5x. And where is it all going right now? Well, in this case, it's leading to this line that's going very... Uh, very clearly up and to the right, 
where the secondary premium on those tickets is going up. Now, we threw the Clippers on here because the Clippers were an example last year. No one thought that was going to be a hot team or a hot game. All of a sudden, the Clippers coming to town was an opportunity for the home team to make a lot of money if they were doing dynamic pricing, even if you'd had perfect initial pricing on this. Same thing is going on now. Every time the Knicks come to town is an opportunity for those teams to dynamically price and make more money, have a healthier bottom line. And this is it. Uh, this is my last topic. Um, and this came up a little bit last year's conference, and I know it gets touched on, which is, wow, HDTV, 3D TV, are people just going to stop going to the game because it's easier to just sit at home, you know, be on the couch? So we asked fans this. We asked them last year. We felt like we needed two years of data before we could uh, say much on this. And so the first thing on the left is just what the purchase levels are. So it's very healthy. I mean, 88% of fans either have HDTV or are planning to get it in the next 12 months. It's pretty much mainstream at this point. The 3D number is becoming relevant. Um, it's a pretty high number, so I think there's certainly a skew for sports fans being more likely to do 3D TV on this. Despite those two numbers going up quite a lot, when you ask the fans, uh, you know, you're going to stay home and watch it on TV or you're going to go to the game, you still see this very strong preference. 87% in both years say, there's nothing better than that live event. I want to be there. You know, despite maybe traffic and all the other things, it's a special thing. You do see some differences across the league, and some of this is how TV-friendly these sports are. Hockey is probably the least TV-friendly sport, and so that's going to index the highest in terms of wanting to be there live. Football, I mean, there's so many instant replays. There's so much commentary and analysis around it. It's the most TV-friendly. That number ends up being the lowest. Not really a concern, because football sells so well, but something to, to keep your eyes on. Baseball and, and basketball are in between. And it really gets to... Um, you know, the, the live event is a special thing. Having a fan, having them in the arena, is, it really matters. There's a nostalgia element and reliving the game experience, and, and we all feel very passionately about this. These are just some of the ways people respond to why they want to go to the event. It's sort of what Ticketmaster is all about and what Live Analytics is trying to help with, which is just how to find these fans, how to target them, how to get them in there. It's always a better experience when the stadium or the arena is full than when there's a bunch of empty seats around you. And um, that's all I've got. So I just want to thank you all. And um, there's a few of us from Live Analytics that are around. We'd be happy to talk to you guys. And I think I'm uh, set to take some questions if people want. So. Um, I think most people agree that we're headed towards dynamic pricing. But do you envision us? ever hitting the point where it's the airline industry where it is changing like by the minute or you buy a ticket and literally the next time it, it's changes you don't think fans will ever be receptive to that um just want to make sure i understood that you're just saying do you think the dynamic pricing will go all the way to the airline model so i think there's a couple teams that are going to try that and, and see around it all I, i'm not sure um if i had to personally sort of go to vegas and handicap it i think you're going to end up more like the southwest model where it's not so dynamic that it's, it's all over the place. There may be some, some more bucketing where it definitely moves, but it's, it's not moving. It's moving in more discrete units um, when, when understandable things are happening around those games. Hello. Um, you had a stat early on that 26% of all tickets to sports go unsold, but one of the last stats you showed is that 87% uh, of fans that you polled uh, say that going to games is right. better than watching it on TV. Right, right. And I don't know if I quoted that correctly, but yeah. um, I'm trying to reconcile that discrepancy. And sure. I'm wondering if you guys have looked into Yeah, that. I mean, it gets to a few things. Um, in concerts, there's a big awareness problem. So we see actually like 35% of seats on concerts go unsold, and, and, a, and a really, uh, it's a shame. Some of that's people just not realizing that there was a concert coming to town. Sports, the awareness is much better. Though this is across all sports categories, so you still will have some cases where someone just didn't know about the event. The other thing is pricing. I mean, you generally find, uh, if I'm going to oversimplify the world, that the really good seats are still a little underpriced and the bad seats are still overpriced. And so there are people who just can't afford to go uh, or they can't afford to go to some of the games they wanted to, to go to around that. And then there's... Um, uh, another factor is just time. 
I mean, you, you, the benefit of TV is that you don't have to get in traffic, make your way in, pay parking, and, and all those kind of things. And so I think those all factor in to why the, the two don't perfectly jive. In regards to uh, dynamic pricing, um, I was kind of curious. It sounded like from Russ Stanley of the Giants, who was you know one of the initial incorporators, right. um, that is actually helping season tickets because you know they could lock in the bottom price and get a lot of value added, um, and it was actually helping drive sales. But have you been able to find out data? Um, it sounds like they're more increasingly against changing prices. You know, in terms of like retention rates. Yeah. So it depends on how you implement it. The Giants did a brilliant thing, and and they have they're in a high demand situation, which helps. So when they launched it, they basically said, "Hey, we're bringing all of our initial prices down. Only expect them to go up over time. And, and you know, as these games get closer. And so everyone sort of liked that conceptually, especially the season ticket holders. I've locked in that lower price, and I expect this to only be a game where the prices go up. Um, if you're going to do it in both directions." then you're going to have more of an issue with the, with the season ticket holders. They had not that first year uh, around it all. Um, so uh, I, there's not enough data yet to actually figure out what the impact is on the amateur broker. So you have, especially for baseball, there's not a lot of people who can go to 81 games. So maybe I go to 40, and then I you know, try to break even or make a little money on the other 40. We haven't figured out what's going on. In theory, you're not going to make as much money on those other 40. And so that's the part we haven't figured out whether that's actually starting to take some uh, people out of the pool because they were, they were not really full season ticket holders. Um, sticking with the whole airline theory and stuff, um, <clears throat> is there any thought of like an orbits guarantee type thing where like, you know, if it, if it ever drops lower than what you paid, you get that money back or anything like that? Any um, teams thinking that way? So we're looking at that a little bit on the, on the Live Nation concert side, just to see what may or may not make sense. Um, I don't know where it'll end up. I, teams are not generally adopting it. It, it somewhat defeats the whole purpose, um, which is, look, it's, this is a dynamic market. The price is going to change around it all. There's, airlines does have some differences in terms of you can really segment the market. If someone's buying three days before the event, it's more likely to be business, travelers, and, and stuff like that that make it easier to slice your, your fan base up. I, um, I personally don't think it's going to be the right way to go. I mean, it's the same thing. You, you buy something on a secondary market, and then you see that the ticket's cheaper. You don't have some expectation that you're going to unwind that deal and, and be able to get the best of all worlds. Any other questions? Do you foresee a world where pricing becomes so efficient that almost every game is sold out? Or what's like the maximum number that teams yeah, can get? So, so no, because if um, efficient pricing sometimes could have some empty seats. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why now teams don't really like that. We don't really like that either. But there are some cases where you, you're going to forego some discounts because the price you're going to get on the people who are going to go nets out into that, into that equation. I mean, it's early days on the pricing. Um, if you just go back to the plumbing, uh, it just wasn't even easy to change prices and make sure that they were populating to all the places correctly. You go to the, some of the arenas or stadiums now, there's still a list of prices that were printed that are up on that. So What's going to happen, I think, over the next few years is just a lot of testing and experimentation and everyone getting a lot smarter about what's really working and not working. Different models, some will change it all the time, some will change it very rarely, and you know, hopefully the best approach will start to win on that. But I don't think you're ever going to have a case where it's always all sold out, as much as that would be great. How about the trend now, maybe more specifically in baseball, in regards to dynamic pricing with late in the season, September with uh, regular players not being played and call-ups uh, getting that? What effect will that have an effect long term on dynamic pricing being uh, the ebbs and flows and who actually shows up in the customer experience based on uh, the, the product on the field? So, I mean, in theory, yes, um, how, how much that plays out and whether, um, 
you know, whether that's really known in advance is, is, is part of the, the, the question on that. Um, if you've paid your money, it's late in the season, and the team is not, is either clinched or not in the playoff race, you already sort of have an indication of how important the game is. That will, and you, you'll see that in demand, you'll see that in the dynamic price. If someone got pulled that was one of the popular players the day of, um, that'll be too late for it probably to have impacted an understanding of demand around that. The team's got a different issue there. Um, and we found this on some of the retention work we did with one team where the mini plan holders who uh, happened to be at a bunch of games where the team did very poorly did, had a much lower renewal rate than the mini plan holders who happened to be at a bundle of games where the team won. I mean, winning solves all problems. The hot dogs taste better, the lines all seem shorter. There, there's an underlying dynamic in, in all of this where the, the win-loss uh, has a heavy influence on, on all of these factors. Have you seen a situation where a team might consider reconfiguring the sort of um, outlay of their stadium to sort of better match their sort of fan base and what yeah, they want? Yeah, no, no question. So that's been going on and, and some really cool stuff. I mean, rewind again a number of years and, and it start with the concert world. is like one price point for 10,000 person amphitheater, right? It's crazy. Now, all the teams have gotten much more sophisticated about how they scale the sections. You'll see some teams where the first row of a section is at a premium price to the rest of the rows in it. You're seeing teams do some interesting stuff, um, you know, hockey and, and basketball teams where they've got those uh, seats that are sort of at the two end zones and they might have had luxury suites and boxes up there. They're knocking the walls out, turning that into like a club so that people that are sitting right below that, they're in the upper bowl, now have this club access. I think uh, there's lots of experimentation and lots of improvements. The teams are getting very smart about all the sort of underutilized assets they may have had and, and slicing and dicing the arena up as much as they can. Uh, as teams move towards you know, more sophisticated ticketing methods in the primary market, what effect is that gonna have on the secondary and especially for you know, large brokers? Does that business start to go away or do they have a role to play over the next few years? Right, so there's always gonna be some need and some role for brokers. You, know, you, you don't know six months ahead of time that you wanna go to that event it's now two weeks beforehand, you really wanna go, you're willing to pay more, no question. It should not be three to four billion dollars. So our view is that it should be much smaller. I, I don't know a number, say 20, 25%. Um, it shouldn't go away. Uh, and then you do have a different dynamic. In concerts, uh, it really is about those very popular acts. In sports, there's, a di there's, uh, there's an extra wrinkle to it because you give the season ticket holder that discount. So that in and of itself immediately creates a little bit of arbitrage right there that's not gonna go away. So how do you, how do you, um, I'm sorry. So how do you um, feel that choose your seat has worked? Do you think it's been a success, a failure? And what's stopping people, what's the hold back from keeping more teams from using it? Because I personally like so it. So yeah, it's been a huge success without question. We see higher conversion rates. So this, this choose your seat is the interactive seat map where instead of clicking best available, you literally can pick the seats, and there's a whole bunch of benefits to it. You can do two in front and two behind, as opposed to four across. Um, we've yet to have a team do it and have anything but, but happiness with it. There, the main pushback and the main concern has been, I don't want a fan to see all the available inventory. So, oh, if they see that, I can get those first row, but every other seat is empty, maybe I don't wanna go. You know, it's like the restaurant that's empty on a Friday night. That being said, there's technology ways where you can just make available 20, the, the best 20%. It, people will sort of be onto that because it's like, all right, all the good seats are available, all the bad seats are, are taken, but that's been the, that's been the obstacle, literally that, that worry. Hello. I suppose uh, a sport team, like a home team, they will perform better when there are more people in the stadium supporting their team. So did you get any pressure from the home team to lower the ticket price so that more people can be in the stadium to support the team? Yeah, so, so we don't set the prices. We, the team set the prices, um, and, and that's entirely their decision. With the models and the tools we've built, we haven't taken that into account. Um, generally, most of the teams want to, uh, they obviously want to maximize revenue, but they have sort of attendance thresholds they want to be above. We haven't seen a lot of cases, to be honest, where you're getting a recommendation that is where the two are not moving together. So you're talking about both more revenue and more attendance with, with the recommended price changes. We haven't run into that yet. Y your question about whether uh, the, the arena being more full leading to the team playing better seems like a great 
like research paper that someone should do for, for next year's conference because it would be it it'd be good to know that. Yeah, if, uh, have any of the teams used the data like you, you demonstrated, you know, when Jeremy Lin comes to town and there's this phenomenon, the prices go up. Have any teams actually looked at that data to try to analyze what the value of their players are? Like if somebody gets hurt, how does that change in the you know the dynamic pricing or you know, yeah. to, to Look at that element of it, that aspect of it. It's a great question. I don't think, um, I don't think the, uh, I just don't think we're there yet to be able to do that. I mean, just getting all the fan data and the ticketing data in one place and making sense of that has been big progress. Then being able to pull additional variables like that into the mix. The, the problem with all this analysis is unless you have all the data in one place and it's sort of normalized and, and you can make sense of it, it's hard to do a lot of these things. And frankly, uh, the teams don't have a lot of idle analytical resources floating around for all that. You will definitely see cases, and I'm sure the teams take this into account, where they do a high profile trade and the next day they sell a whole bunch of season ticket plans. That no one has been able to really systematically put a value on that yet, but that will, I think that's inevitable. There's so much being done on how much you should really pay a player to increase wins, but it really should translate to the gate and TV ratings, which is where you're making your money. Question about ticket fees. So you yeah. talked a lot about the dynamically moving ticket pricing. Yeah. Um, what is or what analysis has gone into the fee structure, both on the primary market and comparing that to what they've seen as the fee structure set in the secondary? So um, we've done quite a lot on two things with the fee structure. One is to make it, um, there's a whole bunch of legacy things in, in how the fees are done that I'm not going to get into why it is the way it is. It's, it's a crazy industry because of that and why they're displayed, when they are and how they are. Leave that aside. I mean, you look at the App Store or like iTunes, strange. We moved very aggressively to get the fees up front so that you would see them right when you started the purchase process because people have a number that they can spend in mind. They then get to the end, you drop another 10% on and it's out of their budget and you just wouldn't get convert people. And that scared sort of artists, concert, and teams a lot because they thought, oh, there's going to be this sticker shock, but it led to higher conversions. People were just happier to know what was happening up front. There's a couple teams that are taking the fee out entirely. They're just saying, this is the price. It's an all-in price, and why should you even care? It's $42. Don't worry about how it gets broken out across all the stakeholders in this. Um, we haven't really done a study with um, how secondary fees and where they're presented compared to primary fees, which I think was, was actually the heart of your question. We, we do know that uh, if you present them late in the process, it lowers conversion rates without question. And we do know that overall, if you present them earlier, the net conversion rate, depending on all the different drop-offs, is better. Uh, hi. So I was wondering that if, um, with dynamic pricing, if teams are willing to buy back tickets from people who don't want to attend the event anymore, something like a refund, so they can then price it, sell it back for a higher price. So, um, the teams are enabling on the season ticket holder a marketplace where it's very controlled. You can put it into the marketplace. Um, so you're a season ticket holder. You've decided you want to sell it back. They sort of get it in an environment where uh, it's safe and it's blessed and sanctioned by the team. The teams themselves buying it back, I haven't actually seen that. That may be going on, uh, but I don't know about it. So what's your sense in uh, you know, airline tickets? You buy a ticket early. You know that on average, 80% of the time, price is probably going to go up. Right. But there is those situations where the price does go down, yep. and you're sitting next to someone that got a better deal than you. Right. So from a season ticket perspective, a system that on average raised the price, do you think that would be palatable to season ticket holders? Or is the idea that at any given game, if I paid more than someone who got, came in late, I'm feeling pretty aggrieved about the situation? And what's your feeling? Would they institute a system that would take advantage of both sides of the market? I, I mean, I just look at... So I'm not sure if anyone's asked the person next to him in a, on an airplane what they paid for their ticket. I'm not sure if anyone's asked the person next to him at a baseball game what they've paid for their ticket. It's happening today. You buy on the secondary market, and you probably did pay either more or less than the person that's sitting right next to you. Sure. It's, I, there's a lot of philosophical things on this that I think that all the teams are struggling with, as are we, but um, it's happening. And I think that's the, that's the, it's an, there's a level of this that is inevitable. Whether it's constant changes or occasional changes, um, I think you just can't leave that money on the table. You know, you're scratching and clawing to, 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 to make money as these teams, and this is just an obvious source of, of revenue and, and money left. Sure. As a follow-up question, 
uh, take a high demand game, very high demand. StubHub, people go to StubHub and they see a very high price. They might react, you, you, is your feeling they react less violently than if it's the Knicks selling them that ticket at $1,000. So no, StubHub, no it's all that's a market. The right. Knicks aren't screwing me. Right. Someone, you know, a thin market is, a high demand is. But the Knicks aren't getting $1,000 here. Yeah. So in some sense, the teams are scared of really using a pure, you know, two-sided auction format, sort of similar right. to StubHub, that might lead to extraordinarily high prices for some events that make them a negative perception. Yeah, no, you're event. exactly right. So I think what the teams will do is they're not going to go to 1000 bucks, but they should probably go above 85 or 120 Maybe sure. go to 250 or 300 So it's not going to be perfect, but I think um, we, Live Nation, Ticketmaster done some stuff on the concert side where you had artists that's, that know the ticket's going to go for thousands of dollars. They sure. just don't want to be the artist that charged $1,000. Mm -hmm. yep. There's all sorts of ways to handle this. One is to do kind of, um, you know, bundle it with some stuff and make it a VIP price. So not only is it, the ticket's actually $200, but you're paying another $100 of stored value, so you're gonna get a bunch of free food, and you're gonna get to go a half hour early and meet some people. Now you can charge $1,000, and it's not in the, there's, there's ways to get around it, and I think y you have to do it. But yeah, the teams don't wanna be the, I'm charging, some don't wanna be the, I'm charging $1,000. Can you explain uh, how strategies like variable pricing and dynamic pricing ultimately are value creation? And in a world where there's more efficient upfront pricing, do these become zero sum strategies ultimately? Yeah, I think um, it's a good question. The way we view, at it, view it selfishly is from a team's perspective. So assume it is a zero sum game for a second. The money should either in our mind, and, and not all of it, but some percentage of the money should be going either to the fan by getting a discount. So the team decides, I've got a section of the stadium, I wanna get it, make it affordable, keep it affordable so I can grow my fan base uh, for whatever reason. Those tickets should go to those fans. That currently doesn't happen. So the value gets pulled out by the broker instead of the fan getting a, a, a deal. The other side is the money should be going to the team. So if the ticket was underpriced and the team wanted to get that money for that front row for that super hot game, the team should get the money. So yeah, even if it's a zero sum game, it's just taking the money to the content owner or the fan and not to a middleman. Well, I think that gets to the 4X, 5X number. You see it, uh, the, the amount of money in, in savings is dwarfed by the amount of money in premiums. And so that part's not a zero sum game. Um, I hear you talking a lot when you talk about dynamic pricing, um, mainly thinking about the thought of it being a problem that two people paid different prices for the seat right next to each other. Um, when you talked about them talking to each other, which you know, you're not saying it's happened, uh, but just the idea that that's out there. My thought is, wouldn't you think of the person who paid for it in advance um, kind of as a way of just hedging their bets and just saying, you know what, I really want to go to this game, and therefore in the future there really being no problem with that? So I think the answer is yes. Um, <laughs> I, I think that's right. I mean, I, I'm, I, I think there's, if you buy early, you've, you've locked yourself in. Um, you're taking some risk out of what may happen to the ticket. There's a value to that. It's like you've bought an option on it and you're willing to do that. Um, I mean, I, the net of it is it's happening, right? And it's gonna continue to happen. It's gonna evolve in a certain way. Um, other industries have embraced it. It's not a complete parallel to these other industries, but it's a great opportunity for the teams. Yeah, I'm guessing generally that the relationship, and this is going off of dynamic pricing actually to a different topic slightly, but you know, lower the price, the more tickets you sell. You know, is there a point that you guys see where that actually breaks down and, and perhaps reverses where you know, a, a customer is looking at a ticket price and saying, this is so cheap, this can't be a good experience? You know, I think the Wizards like, recently got a lot of negative press for selling tickets yeah, like a well dollar. Yeah, well, I mean, that gets back to the, I don't want to keep talking about the secondary market. So uh, one of the things the teams don't like about the secondary market, uh, especially in cases where they've sanctioned it and, and they're advertising it, is because of bad initial pricing and bad variable pricing, the hot games can more than subsidize the cold games. So you make so much money as a middleman on the couple popular games that you don't actually care if you even sell the, the other games. So you post them for a dollar. Nothing could be worse for your brand than, you know, uh, if, if you're the Nets, uh, and I don't mean to pick on them because I'm a Nets fan, um, you've got a bunch of $1 tickets on StubHub. The press always picks it up, and, and it's, 
it's, you know, it's terrible, and it's just for that reason. You've got to solve that by having better initial pricing so that, because it's happening because of that subsidy. They did, in theory, pay $8 for that ticket. Brokers are smart. They're, they're not in the game to lose money. It's that they're subsidizing it with the other games. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I think that's it. Thank you, everyone.